say that we are. This is our nation. Pledge your allegiance. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Shipwreck Show. My name is Shipwreck, and I will be your hostess with the mostest. And happy Wednesday! Happy Wednesday! We're going live today because I want to talk about actually Biden's diary. Because the lady got arrested, she's gonna sit in jail for 30 fucking days. Sonia, Sonia's focused on comments. She's busy talking to you. She don't want to talk to me. God, Sonia, it took me 20 minutes to get here. My internet, listen, before we get started, I have some videos that we're going to play, and uh, I have an interview from Tucker that I want to play, and um, they're older videos about the Ashley Biden diary, but before we go, um, our internet's kind of hit or miss today. It's Cowtown internet. It is how it is. It is what it is. Um, So if it does go down, we'll just have to reschedule. It's been in and out all morning. I'm kind of hoping it's done going out now, but I guess we'll see. So Joe Biden's or Joe Biden, Ashley Biden's diary, this all broke in like 2020, I want to say 2021, 2020, really. And then when it first came out, it was Russian disinformation. That was the narrative that they kept putting around that wasn't real, that it was fake, that she was looking for clout, looking for money, whatever. And it was sold to Project Veritas and Project Veritas put out a video, which I'm going to play. And even then people were like, it's fake and and. It wasn't fake. And then the screenshots of the diary started floating around talking about inappropriate showers, talking about all of the problems that she had had as a child, uh, which led her down the road of substance abuse and all of the um, comparable. I don't I don't know how to say this within community guidelines. that She was basically molested uh, by her dad. She she didn't confirm it, but she thinks she was, according to the diary. And that's what caused her down this road of self-destruction pretty much her whole life. So when it came out, everybody was like, it's fake. The media was like, it's fake. And then the FBI confirmed that it was true because they were going to be doing an investigation into who took it and why and how. And everyone's like, so it is real. And then they're like, no, it's just it's fake. It's just and even to this day, there are people in my comments on TikTok who are saying, wait, it was real. We thought it was was fake. No, it's very real. She was arrested. The lady who had found it and then sold it to Project Veritas was arrested. Uh, She's going to be serving 30 days in prison. She'll be on probation for like three years. And she has to do house arrest after that for an extended period of time. She's got two kids. She's just some no name lady out of Florida. She's a a nobody. You tell me you, you spent a year and a half hunting her down, but you can't find out who brought cocaine to the White House. Fuck out of here. You can't, you can't figure that out. You can't figure out who leaked. Hunter Biden's cell phone cloud that was just closed. You don't want to talk about it. There is. I have this whole theory that the kids are behind a lot of the real bad stuff that Joe Biden is being accused of and and brought to light. And Ashley Biden is part of that theory, because why would she leave her diary? Now, according to the reports, the diary had been there for months and Ashley knew it was there that the friend that she had left it with, the friend's house that she had left it at, had agreed to keep it there. And then at some point, and nobody explained why, or nobody got a, uh, any kind of quote from the friend or anything. At some point, the friend decided to rent out that room and it's a halfway house. Now, in the beginning, this was, it was that she left it at a rehab room. But now people are saying it's it was a hotel, but it was it ha- it must have been more like a halfway house with a, a friend of some sort. She had just gotten out of rehab. And she'd rented the room out and the lady that rented the room found the stuff. And initially, OK, so here's where it gets kind of weird. According to all reports that I've read on this down at the bottom, scroll way to the bottom of any of the reports during this time, she initially took it to the Trump administration. I don't know if you guys knew that. So. She had Amy. I think her name is Amy. She had found the diary, took it to the Trump administration and was like, do you want this? And Trump administration reportedly told her, no, take it to the FBI. But instead, she took it to Project Veritas, who then put out a video on it or who then and and everyone's like they didn't even report it. They did report on it. And then they had to get verification that it was actually Ashley Biden's diary. And so they had put out a memo to Ashley Biden's team saying, hey, we have this. 
Is it hers? Can we confirm? And then they recorded the phone call, which they did release. And I have that phone call right here. Right here. Nope, not that one. I lied. That was This is the wrong one. Stop screen. I have three different tabs up. Give me a minute. I am not organized. That was the Tucker. That was this one. What you're about to hear has never been released to the public. This voicemail was left on the Project Veritas tip line on September 3rd, 2020, which led our journalists to investigate the matter of Ashley Biden. Really quick, this video is older. I want to say it's from 2022. Just to put that out there. Biden's diary, thrusting us into a pivotal moment of history for all of press freedom. Hi there, I'm calling from Florida. My family, their friend who owns a house down here in Palm Beach was renting it out. I don't know how, but this is a while back. But anyway, somebody, a new renter moved in and Ashley Biden was staying in this room and they found her diary, all her clothes, luggage, pills. Anyway, um, diary is pretty crazy. Um, I think it's worth taking a look at. It's not a joke. It's real. And um, I'd love to get it into your hands. After years of public speculation and internal deliberation, we are finally releasing our conversation with Ashley Biden about her diary and other possessions. They were abandoned and later offered to Project Veritas. Hi, is this Ashley Biden? This is she. How are you? I'm doing well. Yeah, I just wanted to, so I heard you have a, a few of my belongings um and so i was going to ask if it would if you could please meet my friend eric who is down in del rey if you could meet him and get and get this up to him there's there's a, a diary here it starts in january it says january at the end of a new york month i'm sitting on a bed uh at the i building yeah so if you could just give everything that you have um, to Eric, that would be really um, um, great. I don't want to give this to to the wrong person. I mean, I want to make uh, sure. At this, is this at this point, and I don't mean to, I, I don't want to have to get Secret Service involved in this, right? Because it just is, it's a whole process. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I am Ashley Biden. It is my stuff. So if you could just skip all of that over, I would really appreciate it. I know you sent a picture to my husband with a camera. <clears throat> and mm -hmm. a few other things that are mine as well. So that would be really great. Where is a good place uh, for him to meet you? There's also this bag with luggage tags on it. Uh, for, and so is that bag, because there's there's all this stuff, is that bag yours too, Ashley? Yeah, it is. Shortly after the phone call, this October 16th letter was sent from Project Veritas, Joe Biden's presidential campaign, asking the candidate for comment. October 23rd. A follow-up email from our then chief legal officer. And on October 29, 2020, Ashley Biden's attorney, Roberta Kaplan, finally responded saying, quote, This is insane. We should send to the SDNY. This is the FBI splash page showing the SDNY immediately opened an investigation into Project Veritas on the very same day. And on November 8, 2020, Project Veritas returns all Ashley Biden's abandoned items, including her diary, to Florida local law enforcement. You're watching Pre-Dawn Raids by the FBI on three Project Veritas journalists. They took place on November 4th and November 6th of 2021. I'm sorry, so what is this regarding? The so yeah so this all happened in 2020 this all happened just as joe biden had taken office just boom she just left it there and it just sat there she didn't go back and get it she knew it was there According to reports, she knew that the the diary was there and the friend had agreed to hold on to it. Why did the friend rent the room out? Why didn't she take her stuff out? 
she knew it was there. She knew somebody would find it. She knew they'd probably try and sell it for money or they would try to turn it over. She left it there on purpose. More to come. More to come because I want to talk about the laptop too. But let's finish this. Are you comfortable with that? Yeah, I'm fine. So, so there's another team coming. Uh, yeah, security will spill up until I get into the house. Incidentally, New York Times national security reporter Mike Schmidt contacts Project Veritas journalist immediately following the raids. A new wrinkle today in the investigation into the apparent theft of the president's daughter, Ashley Biden's diary. The New York Times reporting the FBI Saturday searched the home of James O'Keefe. 47 electronic devices, including our reporters' cell phones, laptops, and thumb drives were seized. To be clear, no one was arrested and no one was charged with any crime. Project Veritas obtained documents showing that SDNY was spying on our journalist well before the FBI raids on our homes in November 2021. Using secret subpoenas, the SDNY was reading our emails and deliberately hid that fact from a judge who barred the government from viewing Veritas's documents. After turning over our communications to the FBI, which included content from personal email accounts of Project Veritas employees, Microsoft, Google, and Apple finally notified us in spring of 2022 when their gag orders were lifted. Nearly two years after these raids, the legal battle for Project Veritas to defend First Amendment rights rages on. To date, we have spent millions of dollars defending these former Project Veritas journalists. We continue to provide representation to all of them. This fight is to protect all journalists from government overreach. If the Department of Justice continues to go unchecked, then our reality of unconstitutional raids, intimidation, and secret subpoenas will cripple any journalist daring to engage in actual journalism. Among the evidence we found of the DOJ trampling on our rights as journalists includes politically motivated spying into journalist news gathering activities, disparate treatment of the press by the Trump DOJ and the Biden DOJ, evidence that the DOJ plays favorites with press entities, including the New York Times, under the Biden DOJ, Project Veritas received no warnings about the secret subpoenas and search warrants of journalists' devices, both personal and professional. Meanwhile, in a similar case, the DOJ allowed Google to alert the New York Times they were coming for email accounts of four Times reporters. This allowed the attorneys for the Times to fight the demands for journalists' emails. Eventually, the DOJ dropped their demands. Just last month, we learned that the Biden Justice Department targeted Project Veritas, a news organization specializing in undercover journalism. Project Veritas was subjected to an extensive investigation by the FBI, including having its emails seized on Microsoft servers. We should all support this legislation and important protections it provides for journalists. There's a reason why the founders chose to enshrine freedom of the press and the First Amendment to the Constitution. This bill, referenced by Congressman Jim Jordan, H.R. 4330, is known as the Press Act. It protects reporters' First Amendment rights. Liberty depends on freedom of the press, whether it's Tucker Carlson, James O'Keefe, Glenn Greenwald, Cheryl Atkinson, or Bob Woodward. Good reporters are those who are committed to holding the government accountable. It passed the House on September 19th, 2022, and is currently before the Senate. That brings us to today. What began as a voicemail left on the Project Veritas tip line has led to this pivotal moment in American history. Okay, I'm going to shut her down there. So that, that was an older video. And she just goes on with the monologue and asks you to donate to Project Veritas. So she just left it. And then Project Veritas, they go through this whole thing, right? And they put it out there. And then the FBI just raids their home. The whole thing seems really, 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 really scripted. Because this all happened at the same time that the laptop from hell had come out. It was in with, I want to say it was within weeks, maybe months, but it all happened pretty much at the same time. And it's full of the same garbage, right? The laptop is full of, of emails and stuff talking about the things that uh, Hunter Biden had done and pictures and so on and so forth. And what really got my theory, like really got me thinking about this theory. I didn't think about this at the time with the Hunter Biden laptop. What really got me thinking about it was when the cell phone the iCloud was leaked. So back in 2020, I want to say two, Hunter Biden's iPhone cloud was, was hacked and leaked out to the public. And in those email and text message correspondence, 
he talked about pedo Peter, right? He had talked about how much he hated his stepmom. And he almost seemed illiterate in a lot. Of, if you read the text messages, they look like they're written by an eight-year-old. It was by some kid. Some, so somebody in there, and they never, that's the thing. They never found out who. There was never a big investigation. They never went after any single mom in Florida. Like, they didn't do anything about this. And this this iCloud, these messages were damning. The pedal Peter stuff still goes around and around and around. And the news tried to spin it, and they were like, he was talking about somebody else, and you're reading it. Like, the whole thing. And they never did a full-blown investigation on it. You mean to tell me that hackers, any hacker, is able to hack into the political, that the time he would have been um, the vice president, the, the former vice president's son's cell phone, his cloud, and leak it out to the public. But they didn't do that for Don Jr., the most hated president of the United States. Like, they didn't do it for the Clintons. They didn't hack into Hillary's daughters. They couldn't do it for Obama's daughters. What about these senators? We can't hack into their iCloud. What about their kids? And if this was so easy to do and there was no repercussions from hacking into Hunter's cell phone, why didn't it happen more often? It only happened this once because he didn't, because nobody fucking hacked into that guy's phone. He turned it over. And I don't know. I don't know when all of this happened, but it had to be during the Trump administration. And when I read that the lady that found Ashley Biden's diary went to the Trump administration first before she went to Project Veritas. So it would have been 2019, early 2020. Like, I, I can't. I think the kids are doing it on purpose. I think they did it on purpose. Hunter Biden's names are all over the illegal um, business dealings with other countries, all over them. Ukraine, China, Burisma, all of it. It's Hunter Biden's name. Even the media came out, and that's what they used to defend Joe Biden. Hunter Biden is a private citizen. We sh they tried to spin it. We should feel bad. He's a recovering at. He's a private citizen. Of course he is. And you can take this all the way back to, to Joe Biden's first wife, with whom Hunter Biden is named after who died in a car accident with, with Hunter Biden's sister. And then a little while later, like months later, he got, he got put into the Senate. And then he married Jill, the babysitter. The babysitter. I think the kids knew, and I think that their home life was awful and toxic and abusive. And I think when they started trying to think that they were going to speak out or getting old enough to recognize what was going on, they were fed drugs to keep them quiet. I think I, I often wondered how and why there were so many incriminating photos on Hunter Biden's laptop. He almost acts, he seems like he's got the mind of a child. Who was taking those photos? Why was he keeping them? And now I'm going to play you the interview because this goes back to the laptop. Knowing everything that you know now and just kind of watching this all unfold from when it first started happening to now it's happening now. There was an interview that was done almost immediately after it had come out and the New York Post article got taken down. There was a there was a, a an interview that was done and that interview was done with the repair shop guy. Who got the laptop because Hunter dropped it off. Who got the laptop? I'm, I'm going to play the whole, the whole interview is like 40 minutes, but I want you to watch it with what you know now. And I want you to tell me if it makes any damn sense because it doesn't to me anymore. I remember watching this the first time and thinking, okay, yeah, you know, he was high on drugs and da, 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 da. Except according to Hunter Biden's book, he was not, he'd been sober for over a year. And he had met that chick and they had gotten married within like a month. That chick is his handler. I don't even know if those are his real kids. Like, none of it made any sense. Pear shop man. The one who came in to contact with Hunter Biden's laptop. It's so great to meet you. I'm glad to have this conversation. I want to hear the story. 
Wow. Where, where do you want me to begin? I'll tell you exactly where I want you to begin. I want you to begin in April of 2019 on a Friday night just before closing time. Well, yeah, it was about 10 minutes before closing. And uh, the I was definitely thinking about getting out of work. I was not thinking about spending time or staying late with uh, with anybody. And then the, uh, the countertop illuminated as the headlights of a car pulled up in front of the shop. And I kind of let out a sigh because I knew that my evening was going to be cut abruptly short or any plans that I had for that evening. And uh, then the client walked in the door with uh, three liquid damage MacBook Pros. And I was able to check in one of them. Uh, the other one was a write-off. The other one I left uh, with the customer so he could take it with him and um, do the recovery himself. I, I was, when I saw the Bo Biden Foundation sticker and the customer informed me that he was Hunter Biden, uh, I, I instantly thought that this was his deceased brother's laptop and he wanted to get his memories off of it. So I decided that, you know what, I'm not gonna close. I'm gonna stay in the shop a little later. I'm going to work with him, see if it's, I can help him out. And I felt bad for him. So he walks in. Do you recognize him? I, I, I've read, by the way, John Paul, you're legally blind. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, when he walks in, at what point do you realize I'm dealing with Hunter Biden? Uh, when I asked him his last name. So the check-in process, I asked the customer his first name, and then I asked the last name. And when he got to Hunter, uh, I wrote down Hunter, and then he, he goes, Biden, and kind of sarcastically, like, uh, I should have known who he was. And and I realized, uh, okay, kind of put two and two together, Bo Biden Foundation. I, I okay, so here's the first part. You mean to tell me that Hunter Biden just walked in at night at closing time with this laptop by himself? He didn't have any secret service. He didn't have a handler or a manager. He didn't have an assistant go and drop that off. He went in there by himself. Where's all the people that are supposed to be, like, protecting him? It was never in my inclination to to pay attention to the Biden family or what they got up to. So I, I really didn't know who he was until he informed me of who he was. Well, I was going to ask you that. I think for a lot of people, unless you're incredibly politically active or politically read in, Hunter Biden isn't an A-list celebrity. The last name Biden is recognizable. Mm -hmm. So at the point that you realize, oh, this is a Biden, as in a political family of Bidens, um, did you know Hunter Biden's story? Did you know about his troubles? Did you know about his drug abuse? Did you know anything at that point? Mm -hmm. yeah, not really. I mean, you hear stories about, you know, the crazy Biden kids, uh, but that's about it. I mean, I, I was living in, in Biden's hometown. Uh, you know, the people that I hung out with went to school with, with Hunter and uh, with other members of the family. So, uh, also, I know several people that have been not paid by the Biden family for various work that's been done over the decades. So it, it's it's we kind of knew it gets what the better. Just wait about we know the political family. We also know that sometimes they get, get into trouble. Sometimes they have a hard time paying their bills. So that's that's based upon being in the Biden hometown. Your mm -hmm. your your depth of knowledge immediately is more than the casual news viewer, even maybe the the well read news viewer, because you're living in the town and there's reputations around mm -hmm. the family. What was the state of Hunter Biden when he came in that night? Um, he he was definitely feeling no pain. Uh, he was intoxicated. Um, he had a, a little bit of a mobility issue. Um, speech was a little slurred. Uh, when I actually left the shop, probably about 45 minutes after he left the shop, uh, I noticed his vehicle was still there. I just assumed that he was sleeping one off. Okay, hold the fuck up. So let me get this straight. The VP son, the ex-VP, former VP. I cannot. I can't increase the volume. I just tried. It won't let me do it. Um, the former VP son. He comes into your shop. He seems stoned out of his gourd. He's definitely feeling good. And when he left, and then 45 minutes later, you left. You saw his car sitting there and you just assumed he was sleeping. You didn't call somebody. I would have called somebody. I would have called anybody. You wouldn't have gone in and looked in his car and checked. Make sure own boy is all right. And why was he bringing it to a repair shop in Delaware anyway? Why would he not have people for that? Okay, moving on. Moving on. 
because he was, yeah. So, okay, he walks into the shop. It's 10 minutes before closing time on a Friday night. In your estimation, he's inebriated. He is entitled to his reputation, meaning he already assumes you should know who he is as well. And he lays three water-damaged laptops on your counter. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you do then. Do you decide to stay late? You said you wanted to help him out. Does yeah. he stay with you? What's the process at that point in time? So I, I take a look at the first machine. It was a complete write-off. Apple solders the components to the logic board, so there's no way that I can recover data if I can't power on the machine. And the machine was just too far gone. So I just pushed that back to him. The uh, second machine just had some in inoperable keys. So I said, hey, look, here's a keyboard. You can use the keyboard to log in. That's when, unfortunately, he informed me of what his password was. And then I... Uh, what was that? Oh, I, I don't want to repeat that on the news. It was something inappropriate? It was, it was very inappropriate. Yeah. Um, so I gave him a keyboard so he could facilitate his own backup. Again, because I felt bad for this guy. He, I, I thought he was upset and he had been out on a bender because he was trying to reconcile with his dead brother's data that's on these computers. Uh, the third computer, there was a glimmer of life, but it would have required me to check it in so I could take it apart, disconnect some components to get the machine up and running. And I explained that process with him. I printed up an authorization allowing me to take custody of the machine. And I had him sign that document, review the document with him, and then uh, he left. And then I took the machine into the back and I started working on it. So, and for what it's worth for anybody watching that wants to know, by the way, his password, which is part of what is revealed in your book, mm -hmm. uh, references, I think, two separate sex acts at the same time in one password. And he shares that with you. Um, and um, it's my understanding then, so does he take the first two laptops with him when he leaves and leaves only one of the three with you in your custody? Correct. Okay, and so now you stay at the shop and you decide, I'm gonna go ahead and start mm -hmm. what? What Start doing what to this computer? Well, he hired me to do the data recovery. So I booted up the machine, got the machine to a point where I could start to do a recovery. And uh, the condition of the machine didn't allow me to do a what's called a forensic copy. I had to literally just drag and drop folders. So I dragged the most important folder, dragged and dropped it to the server, and I said, that's good enough for tonight, and I left. I came back the next morning to discover that the machine had died during the process. I only was able to recover about a third of the data. So I had to kind of go through and look at what I recovered compared to the original to see what made it over and what didn't. And that's when I realized that the person that, A, this is not his brother's laptop, and that the person that's starring in a lot of this homemade porn is actually the guy that dropped off the laptop. Okay, so, so during the data recovery process, you you can see, you begin to see what is on the files? During the verification. So when when uh, I went to go and copy data and then the, the machine shut down, I don't know where it stopped. It didn't complete the copy. So I had to look at two lists of the data and then where something didn't match up, I'd click on it and then drag it to the folder so that the two lists would match up. It's in that process of clicking on a file, looking at the thumbnail, previewing the image. That's when I realized there was a considerable amount of pornography on this computer. Which I've heard you say, by the way, is par for the course in your business. Yeah, it's an occupational hazard. What, a lot of people have porn on their computer and a lot of people seem to damage their computer, so you see what's on a lot of people's computers? Um, it depends if it's if I'm hired to recover data or if somebody's having a problem with their data, then I'm going to have to look at the data to perform that. If somebody just needs the screen replaced on their on their laptop, there's absolutely no reason to look at a customer's data at that point. There's it's not the cause of the problem. Yeah, I wanted to follow up with you on that because um, I think I've never taken a device to a repair shop, so I can't speak from personal experience, but. I guess I might assume there's some expectation of privacy. Mm -hmm. Should Hunter have assumed some expectation of privacy at this point when it's in your custody? Did you break any ethical guidelines or anything by looking at his data? Uh, you, you know what? I don't think so. I know there's been a lot of people out there that, that question that. Um, he wanted me to recover his data. Uh, when, a, when a customer requires a data recovery, it's usually for two things movies and pictures. It's for the things that you can't replace. Um, you can always write a paper again, if it's a college paper. You can always re-download music that you've downloaded, or you can always read down, anything that you've downloaded, you can always replace. 
you can't go back in time and take a photograph or a movie. Once you lose that data, that's irreplaceable. So when people come in for data recovery, that's what they want. That's what's irreplaceable. So I have to go in and recover typically that type of data, pictures and video. And to make sure I'm not going to drag and drop a folder and then call a customer and say, hey, it's done. Come on in. Give me your credit card. I'm going to make sure that I did the job correctly. And in that process, you have to verify the content that's on the computer, uh, whether it's just quickly looking at it in a list view or if it's in case of where there's a potential of data corruption, corruption manifests itself in video formats more than anything else because video is very intensive, audio is intensive. If there's corruption, it'll pop, it'll squeak, the video will get distorted. It'll manifest itself and you'll be able to see it. So when I opened up a video file that was rather large, that would have been a prime candidate for corruption if there was any corruption in the data transfer, that just so happened to be a homemade video of Hunter. So it's a homemade video of Hunter doing what? Well, amazingly, multiple illegal hacks at the same time, but I don't want to go into detail. Multiple illegal acts? Are you talking yeah. about? Well, smoking crack and um, I, you know, while engaged in uh, sex trade. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'm not a lawman. I didn't. <laughs> so you're in your repair shop. This is the following day, I take mm -hmm. it. Um, you're starting to see what's on some of these files. You're seeing pornography. In your estimation, you're seeing illegal acts, drug use. What do you do next? I do the job. I mean, he, his dad's not running for president. This is just a guy. He wanted me to recover the data. I, I saw a couple of financial documents that raised some red flags. But again, this is none of my business and it's stuff. And I'm charging him way too little to do what I was doing. So I just wanted to get the job over and done with it. And it really wasn't until two weeks later when his dad announced his candidacy that I started to get a fear for, okay, I've seen some very embarrassing material on this laptop. I'm pretty sure nobody. Okay, hold the fuck up. So this happened two weeks before Joe Biden announced he was going to be running for president in 2020. Is that, is that right? Did I hear that right, Sonia? So two weeks before Joe Biden announces his presidency for 2020 running, that he's going to be running for president. Hunter Biden, he knew. I mean, everybody knew Joe was probably going to run a good month or so before he announced. I mean, that, you know, you figure it out after some time. But before two weeks before he announced, Hunter just drops this laptop off. He's like, hey, <laughs> hey, <laughs> I need my porn back. Like, why? There is no way that you do that. There is no way that if your father is gearing up to run for president in two weeks, you don't have a shit ton of people around you nailing things down. There's no way. Okay. 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 He's going to want this embarrassing material out there or, or the knowledge of somebody that's seen it talking to anybody. So that's when I started to get more and more concerned for my personal safety because, and I think as we've all seen recently, the the Secret Service is is the Biden family fixer service. You know, they've bailed out Hunter, whether it's pulling guns out of trash cans or it's waking him up when he's on a OD at a hotel, it's or using his dad's credit card. It's kind of I expected the Secret Service to addicts might not do anything rational, but the people that the Bidens would have been surrounded with two weeks before he was going to announce his run for presidency absolutely would have put a lid on this shit. Absolutely would have. They wouldn't have let him get in his car and drive down there and drop this off. There's no way. To come into the shop to sweep that laptop under the carpet and take me along with them. But you said that's after two weeks of having the laptop when mm -hmm. his dad announces he's running for president. Mm -hmm. What happens in the interim? You've got the laptop for two weeks. Is the job done? Yeah, Do I, you try to get I it finished back to the Hunter? job uh, on, well, I called up Hunter, I believe it was the 16th, and, uh, or I think I called him up on the 15th and said, you need to go out to pick up a hard drive. He picked up a two terabyte, uh, I believe it was a two terabyte Western Digital. I think it was from Best Buy. Uh, he dropped that off on the 16th. I told him he could come in the next day to pick everything up. I transferred the data from the store server to the external overnight. 
I came in the morning the next day. Uh, transfer was complete. I called him. I sent him a square per his request, a, one of the square online request payment requests. Uh, filled that out, sent that in an email. Uh, I think I called him again the following weekend or right before the end of the month. I always call customers at the end of the month to collect on out of uh, uh, delinquent bills. Uh, and then uh, I think I called him a couple more times over the next month after that. So just no response. And by then, so you had multiple contacts with Hunter over the first couple of days of your introduction. You mm -hmm. tell him, come back. This is going to take a couple of days. Then you tell him, bring me a new external hard drive. And am I reading the situation right? You have pulled his data onto one of your servers, a mm -hmm. storage server that you own and maintain. Specifically for backup, yep. Specifically for backup. And then your plan is to then transfer the data onto an external hard drive that he purchases. And yep. he does so, and he brings it to you? Mm -hmm. Yep. I say, now you've transferred the data onto his external hard drive. I assume at this point it's still on your server as well. Correct. And do you, as he, and he, sort of disappears on you. So he disappears and never comes for that external hard drive that now maintains the data? So now I'm in possession of his laptop, a backup of his laptop's home folder on an external drive that he provided, and no sign of Hunter. And the data as well and on your data. own server. Yeah. And Hunter never comes back. Mm -hmm. Have you heard from Hunter since that day? No, I, the closest I've heard to Hunter was on October 13th, so the day before the October uh, 14th New York Post story. Uh, Hunter's lawyer calls me to see if uh, I, I if I was still in possession of the laptop. When is this? This was October 13th of 2020. So the day before the New York Post. The day before the original New York Post story that was, of course, censored on social media mm -hmm. and called Russian disinformation. You yeah. got a call from Hunter's attorney saying, do you in fact have the laptop? Yep. He actually said, uh, I think my client Hunter left the laptop with you sometime in 2017. Uh, do you still have it? So I actually told him what the FBI told me to say. If the FBI told me that if anybody comes looking for the laptop, you're to stall them. If they come in, just say, hey, it's in an off-site location. Give me a day or two. I'll retrieve it and give you a ring, collect their information, pass that on to the FBI, and the FBI would return the laptop. Three years later, you get a call from Hunter's attorney, not mm -hmm. until the imminent drop of the New York Post story. All right, I want to rewind back, though, mm -hmm. to the three years prior. I'm still focusing on this period in time where you have his physical property and his data. What have you, did you speak to an attorney in this time about custody? At some point, I assume when a customer no-shows you, mm -hmm. doesn't return your calls, doesn't come back for their property, what happens to their property? Does it become your property? Well, on the document that hunter signed it clearly states at the bottom after 90 days uh comes uh, at that point I mean, there's what's the saying it's uh there's no um assumption of um privacy when it comes to the things that you abandon so i knew that this laptop became my property and i by then then this was what mid-july it became my prop um and i knew that that i needed this thing out of my shop by then i had uh shortly thereafter it became my property i took a look at some of the data because barisma was in the news uh i definitely saw some things that were a concern an obscenely large amount of money being traded hands with barisma in exchange for favors from the state department and basically a pay for play scheme. Yeah. And I knew that between that and the embarrassing content that was on the laptop, I needed to get this to the authorities, if anything, for my protection, but if anything else, that this was possible evidence in an, an investigation that needed to be attended to. And so what did you do? When is the first time you reached out to the authorities and who was that? So I was a little reluctant to approach the FBI in this neck of the woods. Um, I think Roger Stone had had his house raided in like the prior January. So I was really concerned. And I think we've all seen the, the Russian collusion for three years. So I was concerned that the FBI was weaponized and I didn't trust anybody local. My father, who's a retired Air Force colonel of 31 years, um, is, lives out in New Mexico. So I had a conversation with him and said, I 
I voiced my concerns and I was like, I want to get this to the authorities. I want to get it to the FBI because I feel like this is the proper channel. Uh, but I need to do it in Albuquerque. I can't, I can't do it myself. I'm too afraid to do it myself. Uh, so I enlisted my father to do it for me. Uh, so he approached the Albuquerque field office for the FBI in October, early October of 2019, uh, which turned out to be probably, as he described it, the most humiliating experience of his life. Why is that? Uh, well, he's a 31 year Colonel and you know, gave 31 years of his life to the defense of this country. And he walks into an office where the FBI agent basically tells him to lawyer up, get the hell out and don't talk about this. Really? Yep. And this is, my dad was sitting there with a hard drive, a copy of the drives and paperwork saying, help protect my son. That's all my father wanted was to make sure that his son had some level of protection. This is the first attempt to reach out mm -hmm. by either you or somebody on your behalf mm -hmm. you, you hadn't talked contacted your own attorney yet you hadn't done anything your first move is to go to the fbi but the mm -hmm. fbi in albuquerque through your father yep and he's rebuffed and yeah he's basically uh this this agent never gave him his name um kind of questioned why my father was being kg um uh, when my father explained the situation and, and an effort uh, to to attain some level of protection for me, uh, the FBI agent was like, well, we, you know, th unless there's a criminal activity going on, and we can't, and he goes, well, drug use and, and prostitution is a criminal activity. And the guy's like, you know, looked at the paperwork some more and then basically was like, like you know, you need to get out of this office and you need to lawyer up and, and don't talk to anyone about this. What's the relationship between you and you? And the FBI been like since that moment. Well, after after that interaction at the uh, in Albuquerque, uh, my father and I were just disenfranchised. We thought there was, you know, we didn't know what to do. A month later, that an FBI agent named Joshua reaches out to my father in an effort to get a hold of me. That we finally thought maybe somebody's going to take this seriously. Uh, so the FBI met with me at my home and asked me about my concerns. I voiced my concerns and they, I then shifted and said, Hey, can, can I just want this out of my shop at this point, just get it out of my shop and give me a phone number. I can call. Should somebody come looking for it or wants to harass me about it? And they're like, yeah, we can't do that. We're going to talk to our legal team and see what we can do. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, dying here. I just, I just want this over and done with. Uh, then they said they were going to come and they wanted to make a forensic clone of the drive. And I was like, well, that's going to be hard to do, but sure, whatever. You guys have the best tech guys in the world. So, you know, let me know when you want to come in. And they agreed to come in on December 9th. Uh, when they showed up, instead of bringing a tech guy with them, they brought a subpoena. And they're like, yeah, we're just going to take everything. And I'm like, okay, great. Take it, take it all. This is exactly what I wanted in the first place. And uh, so I gave him the drive, I gave him the laptop, I gave him the paperwork, and, uh, and and then they gave me a lot of things to sign, and I got my first subpoena, and and then I, I don't know, I was a bit uncomfortable, a little nervous, but then excited at the same time. So I kind of cracked a joke. I said, uh, "Don't worry, lads. When I when I write the book, I'll leave your names out of this." And that's when uh, Agent Mike turned around and said, "Oh, it's in our experience, nobody, nothing ever happens to people that talk about these things." And I was like, "Great." All right, well, they're taking it, so that's something. And then they told me that uh, should anybody come looking for it, you should uh, stall them, uh, tell them it's off-site, and then give us a call, and we'll return it. And then that threw up another red flag, because in my mind, this is going to be put in an evidence envelope and then sent to a lab somewhere outside of D.C., so how could it be easily returned? So, and then a couple weeks after that, that was December 9th, I think a couple weeks after that, I got a call from Agent Mike, who also said only communicate from that point on through text messaging with him only. He's the only agent that I'm allowed to talk to moving forward, but he's also the only agent that wasn't on any of the paperwork. So he's uh, kind of the bag man, I, I, I assumed. Uh, but he, he checked on me and I said nobody had come in to look for it. He seemed surprised. And then that was the last I heard of the FBI. This was when? What year? This you was said December, this of December of 2019. So I got to ask you, John Paul, if you wanted this, and you said your father reached out in October of 2019 mm -hmm. in Albuquerque, if you wanted this out of your possession so desperately, 
I believe it legally came into your possession as your mm -hmm. property in the summer of 2017. Well, the Hunter's lawyer said my a customer dropped it, or Hunter dropped it off in 2017. He dropped it off in 2019. He, Hunter didn't even remember when he dropped it off. The, the Hunter's lawyer thought he dropped it off in 2017. Oh. So he, that's kind of, I was like, all See, right, this guy's all over the map. He, he doesn't remember. That's just like, it, it's all over. Like, it doesn't make, none of this makes any sense. It's like this, like two people didn't get their story straight. And so they're kind of fucking it up. It doesn't, I just, I don't believe that this was just some kind of like drug fueled idea that Hunter just got up one morning. He's like, you know what? I really want to see my porn today. I'm going to take this in and get it back. It's just, that seems so stupid. And nobody would let him do it. There's no way that anybody in the Biden administration is going to let him just wander off on his own with such incriminating evidence. I just, the whole thing is super sketch. And then when he talked about his dad, who had been a retired Navy colonel, and that they had gone to Congress before they went anywhere else, they had gone to the FBI and then they had gone to Congress to try to get it. Like that whole thing just seems freaking weird. And I feel like this guy is just. I mean, he's got the hat and he's, you know, his dad's like a war here. I, I, the whole thing seems really just scripted. It just does. OK, it's almost over. Well, it's almost almost over. Remember, I see. Right. So you held on to the laptop for a couple of months before mm -hmm. reaching out to the FBI. Mm -hmm. um, okay, yeah. let's take a time out in at this. I wanna ask you a yeah. couple of non sequitur questions. First of all, yeah. I asked you this in the, um, in the green room and I think anybody that watches you probably has this question sitting at the top of their head. What is sitting on top of your head? <laughs> <laughs> what is the hat? Uh, the, the hat generates liberal tears. <laughs> um, so I, it's a ball moral. It's like a beret with a pom-pom. It has my family's crest. I have a small collection of them. And I have an ugly head, and it's a good way to cover it. Plus, I, I'm visually impaired. Right. I walk into low-hanging branches, stop signs, uh, countertops. So it's nice to have some good, like a bumper here to kind of <laughs> stop that from doing damage. Uh, I always wear the hat. I'm, I get sunburned. I'm an albino. So I get burned through brick walls if I'm not careful. Wow. And so I wear the hat a lot. When everything hit the fan in October 14th of 2020, uh, See, a lot did it of the again. hate mail that I was receiving, a lot of the death threats, a lot of the... Full stop. See, he did it again. So at the beginning of this interview, he says that the laptop was dropped off in 2019, right before Joe Biden was to announce his presidency. Now he's reverting back to 2014, where he says that he started getting a bunch of hate mail and all this stuff. But the, the, the laptop hadn't even been put out to the public for years before that. It didn't even sent to the public. Yet. Why was he getting hate mail on a, something that nobody could see and nobody had, had, had even heard about? It's like they can't keep their story straight as to what they're supposed to say. The anti-pro-assumption Russian disinformation emails always seem to kind of have a theme. He's blind. A common theme. Another way. And that was, uh, you know, Putin thanks you for your service and your hat is stupid. Or that hat is something ugly, and and it's uh, and I got a kick out of that because it kind of told me, it gave me a little insight to these people that they cared more about the hat than about the truth, and then I realized that the hat's really triggering a lot of these people, and then I decided to uh, why why stop a good thing? And um, you've said several things there that I want to follow up mm -hmm. on. Um, I'm curious, just following your own curiosity about the legally blind. What what? because it ties into what we originally talked about when Hunter walked into the shop of what you were able to see or ascertain in that moment. Um, what can you see? Can you, uh, can you see me well right now? Um, yeah, you're a white dude with a blue tie. <laughs> that's, uh, that's good. Uh, yeah. Dark hair. I, I have an operational vision of about four to eight inches. So if I needed to read, it's pretty much right up in front of me. After that, about four to eight feet, I can see enough to move around unless uh, like this morning, trying to get into this building was murder because it was all glass front. Uh, I walked up to what I thought was a door and I was searching for the handle and I couldn't find it. And then I kept looking and then I watched a gentleman walk through a revolving door about 10 feet away from me. And I was like, that's it. And then he looked at me weird too. So 
you know, I'm used to it. I'm, well, I appreciate you making your way in this morning, and I really appreciate you sharing the story with us. I have many more things I want to talk about. I'm going to monitor our time here. Mm -hmm. um, so um, let me ask you this. Let's go directly to it because you did bring it up. Are you a Russian asset? Are you perpetuating <sighs> Russian disinformation? Yes, comrade. I mean, this is if this the GSB is putting out things like this, then, then I don't think we have anything to worry about from Putin if this is uh, what they're training their agents to look like. Um, I just think it's the, the irony, like my, my family from the entirety that they've been in this country, okay, my grandfather came to this country, fought in World War II, fought in Korea, fought in Vietnam as a pilot in the Army Air Corps and the United States Air Force. My father fought during the latter part of the Cold War. So for the entire Cold War, there have been Mac Isaacs flying planes going after communists. And to be accused of being one of those communists or even playing a part in that is just absurd to me. Now, the, the, the thing that bothers me about that, because I, I, I brush it off, but everybody else thinks that I contributed or I worked with a foreign power to help affect the outcome of an election. I mean, people associate that with traitorous activities, and I've been labeled a traitor because of that. And to have a family name that has served bravely and proudly in this country's military for so long, have that tagline traitor next to it is just, I'll, I'll fight like hell to prevent that from happening. I'll tell you that. I can understand, especially when what you're doing in many's estimation is an act of patriotism, sharing potential corruption, potential corruption that should be investigated within the United States government. Um, on that note of being called a traitor of, of trafficking in Russian disinformation, you have sued uh, Politico, mm -hmm. The Daily Beast, CNN, and Congressman Adam Schiff for, <laughs> um, for sullying your good name mm -hmm. for slander. Tell me about that lawsuit. Well, I went after Twitter originally because they labeled me a hacker. And if I was ever going to be any start up any kind of computer repair business again, uh, having the, the title hacker is more, to me at that time, more devastating than being labeled a Russian asset, which was just ridiculous. Uh, so I went after Twitter and tr they switched judges with an Obama appointed judge and the, she threw the case out with prejudice and awarded Twitter the Florida sta slap statue. So I was basically wiped off the map. I yeah, was you're destroyed. Right. The original accusation was that it was hacked material. Yeah, Twitter's accusation. Twitter didn't say I was a Russian. Twitter said that it was hacked material, ergo I was a hacker. Whereas Hunter gave me his password. Usually hackers don't get the privilege of having the owner give them their password. That's not hacking at that point. That's just accessing. So it's it was ridiculous, but it, it had a... As a, on a career standpoint, being labeled a hacker is a death sentence. Um, Twitter wanted to make an example out of me, so they punished me in the courts and financially, and I, I never thought I would have an opportunity to defend my actions or hold those accountable again. Uh, that's one reason why I, I sat down and I wrote my book, because I, I knew that in the court of law, I was destroyed, but maybe I still had a chance in the court of public opinion. Uh, turns out, that about a month ago, uh, Joe Flynn, uh, General Flynn's uh, brother uh, from the America Project, uh, approached my attorney and wanted to uh, fund our lawsuits. So uh, I now have a second chance to hold these people accountable, and I'm, I'm going to fight like hell to do it. In any type of defamation suit, you have to prove damages, and you have paid a price, right? Yeah, I lost my business. I was forced out of my state for about a year. Um, I, I've been singled out by the IRS. Uh, I was denied unemployment. Um, Is that right? Yeah. Um, so you lost your business. Mm -hmm. well, how were you forced out of your state? Uh, I was getting too many death threats. It was, it, was, um, the, it was no longer safe for me to be in Delaware. You've been audited by the IRS? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they looked back. Uh, they found $58 last September, $58 from 2016. So I guess I've been okay on my taxes, but and you've been denied unemployment? Yep, I was denied unemployment for a year, even though my business paid into unemployment for 10 years, and this was exactly what unemployment was there for. I started applying for it in December of 2020, and uh, I, it took me writing a letter.
Okay. And the rest of this video, he just talks about how it detrimentally affected his life and, and how he talks about his lawsuits and things like that. You can go watch the entire thing. It's like another 20 minutes. The whole thing is listed in the stuff playlist that we have on this page. You can go find it. It's probably about 10 or 15 videos down. Um, and just go, you know, kind of watch the rest of it. And then, cause it was shortly after this Hunter Biden's iPhone cloud was hacked by a bunch of, I don't even know kids on 4chan. Uh, your brews are hot. Hold on. Click the icon and you're just a lot of access. I don't even know what's going on. Hold on. I got a video for this too. Maybe. Yes, I do. And this was reported kind of, but then it was just kind of, I don't know, stopped being really talked about other than the pedal Peter stuff. <laughs> And the White House never verified it. They were like, but they never denied it either. How does somebody hack in to the former VP's son's cell phone? That just doesn't happen. I'm so sorry. but I, And why does Ashley Biden just leave this diary full of incriminating evidence laying around out in the public for anybody to see? They just, you don't. You just, you don't. Because we bet your sorry ass if it had been any of the Trump kids who had done anything like this, the people would have found out. I think that during Trump's presidency, because he wasn't supposed to win, everybody, that's what everybody keeps saying. He wasn't supposed to win. And I think that as soon as he was, as soon as he was announced as president of the United States, like they knew shit was coming, because it's all of them. It's Biden's and the Obama's and the Clinton's. They all, like shit was coming downhill. And I think in order to save their asses, from a lot of the stuff that they possibly probably did, they flipped and they said, yeah, we'll give you all this stuff. We'll set it all up and we'll make Joe Biden look like an absolute ass. And that's because that's exactly what this entire presidency of Joe Biden's is about outside of like ruining lots of lives. But Joe Biden is going to go down in history as and, and the Biden family as the worst president in the history of the United States. Hands down. And I think they flipped. I think they they probably were looking at some serious jail time. I, I just, I can't believe that they would be this careless. And they would be allowed to be this careless. Because if it was so easy to be just, just this careless, why haven't any president, other president's children done it? I'm sure there's some scandalous shit from the Obama daughters. Outside of them not really being their daughters. <laughs> That's a whole nother rabbit hole. But why hasn't any of this happened to the other kids? It easily could have. If it's so easy to do it to Hunter, who's protected by the media, protected by everybody, the DOJ. How does something like this happen? I just, I can't. And now you're seeing a woman who was arrested for Ashley Biden's diary for stealing it. You're seeing her get arrested and get sentenced to prison time. And you're seeing all of these people come out and they're like, well, wait, now, is it real then? Now that she's been charged, is this real? Well, we all knew that's always been real, but so I guess some people didn't. I didn't know that. But people in my comments were telling me. I'm like, I didn't, I had no idea. And the media, they're just, they're not covering. It's so frustrating because they're not covering what's in the diary at all. And they should be. This is the person that is supposedly running our country. He should be called out at the very least why aren't they asking about it hey can you talk to us about the contents of this this diary is any of this true no joe biden's meeting with the the prime minister of japan today there's no big press conference there's no address the nation 
There's no demand from the media to do it either. It's just being happened. It's just happening. This should be the biggest scandal in Joe Biden's entire presidency. Because this is something everybody can relate to. This comes a week after all of the P. Diddy underage stuff was going on. Which came a week after. Quiet on the set came out. This is at the forefront of everybody's minds. Older, disgusting men getting with little younger kids. Family members be damned. And the media is just not, they're not, they're, they're, they're damning this woman that sold it. They're like, she's just a little thief. Bitch, what's in the diary? Like, why aren't you telling people? Why isn't there a ticker going across CNN? Joe Biden is a pedophile. Joe Biden's daughter is accusing him of, of, of taking inappropriate showers. We demand answers. Nobody is. Not one news outlet. Tucker did back when this first broke, when he was still with Fox News. <laughs> and there are people that are still going to vote for him. They're all over Twitter. I'm going to vote for Joe, but they the high profile people. Your author, what's his name? He wrote It. I love that book. I hate that guy. Stephen King. I'm going to vote for Joe. Fucking back up then. You take inappropriate showers with your kids too? Listen, and then there's the crass and teen guy on Twitter who is like, it is perfectly normal for a father to take a shower. Did you see that? For a father to take a shower with his daughter. In what fucking world? Because when I was a little girl, I don't have any memories of taking showers with my dad. I have memories of my dad standing outside the door or standing right outside the shower so that I could stick my hand out and he could put shampoo in it. I was probably like five because I would always use too much shampoo. In my own mind, huge disappointment. I love Stephen King books and the movies. Huge disappointment. But they're just not. It's so broken. It's so broken. This would have been a huge scandal 40 years ago. This would have been Watergate. Huge scandal. Just fucking nothing. It barely got a blip. I don't want an apology from anybody. We've been talking about it forever. I don't care about an apology, but recognize. All I need you to do is some self-recognize, like self-recognition. That's all I need from you. I need you to vote differently. I need you to vote differently. Because fucking A. Johnson. These are, they're, they're kids. She's so fucked up. She's so messed up. The daughter is so... And you can't help but feel for her. God, wasn't the Obama girls on that laptop too? I could never verify that for sure. It had to do with the dog. Like they're the dog that the Obamas had and then the dog that showed up with the naked girls on the laptop were the same. You can't help but feel a little bad for them kids. You just can't. What a nightmare Joe Biden had to have been in his younger days. What a fucking nightmare. Yuck. Stephen King has a sick mind. I guess, but he just shut up about politics, man. I loved his books. I did. I loved his books. Loved the movies. I'm a big horror movie fan. I haven't watched them since. The credit card with Millie Obama. Yeah, I mean, all of this. But the, they, they... God, even after the laptop came out to be verified as true, they didn't talk about any of that. Media didn't talk about that. And they have to, because that's the only way you're going to get other people to see what they won't. Yuck. It's so frustrating. And I hope that more people talk about it. You know what? And I hope that more left-leaning people. I'm not asking you to be conservative. 
I'm not even asking you to, I'm not asking you to change your values. I'm asking you just to talk about it. We've talked about Trump's rape um, um, accusations. Just talk about it. I don't, you know, I don't want, I don't want any of that more than if it was Trump, this, I would, I'd be just as mad. But I, I can't be, I can't find anything like this under Trump, but edited photos. You tried, you tried, but luckily we have tools for that now. Wasn't Pelosi's son in a pic on the laptop too? I don't, I don't remember that. I remember the Obama girls. I remember the niece. The whole family is nothing but a bunch of drug addicts. Right down to Bo's wife. She was a big drug addict. She's the one that introduced crack to fucking Hunter. I mean. This would just be a, such a huge. I get, you have a huge scandal. But they're just not talking about it. And Joe Biden's, not, and they're not going to ask her about it. They're not going to ask Joe Biden about it. People are still going to vote for him. And that's so frustrating. Yuck. But I'm telling you, I think the kids did. I think they did it on purpose. I think they flipped on their dad. I think the documents, the, the, the classified documents that Joe Biden was being investigated for, um, I think that was another play by Hunter Biden to get him off the hook for some of the charges that he had because he sat right next to that box of classified docs, smoke crack. He talks about it in his book and in interviews when he talks about his art, fucking art. Maybe he was paint. Maybe he was getting money for flipping on all of them. And maybe that's what those paintings were about. I don't know. I just, I find it so coincidental that they would just do that. I don't think it's, I think it was intentional. I think they got a lot of hatred for their dad and a lot of hatred for their stepmom or her. It would have been her real mom, his stepmom, a lot of hatred. That, that was obvious in the iCloud leak. They just, they, and they all hated each other. They fucking fought and they hated each other and they got each other hooked on drugs. It's just, what a sad story. I will never run in politics. Because I I'm not gonna subject my family to anything like that, or even close to being offered anything like that. Like it's just so sad, it's so gross, and pathetic that the media won't cover it in the way that it should be covered. I mean, if you want to punish the lady you claim that stole the diary, fine, but you need to start putting what was in that diary out to the people. People have a right to know that you fucked up in the beginning when you said it was disinformation. Just come out and apologize. They haven't. No way they asked. No, there's no way they, there's no way that some 4chan kids got in and hacked Hunter Biden's cell phone cloud. If it were that fucking easy, hack them all. I want to see everything. Never happened again. Never happened before that. Fuck out of here. So, yeah, but the the media's, I mean, media as a whole is pretty much done. I get most of my information from people on X who put stories together. And then I grab different pieces of different media and I just take the bias out of it and try to line timelines. It's kind of a pain in the ass, but I think you're going to see a shift in that too. And people are going to, they already are. They're going to go more to their favorite. Twitter accounts or their favorite podcasters and try and get their more, the majority of their news from there and ideas from there as to what's going on. And I'm kind of happy for that because what a nightmare the media is. What a nightmare it was with the COVID. The COVID stuff, they released all of that quietly during the solar eclipse. So the WHO, they admitted that a lot of the things that they did during COVID weren't helpful. They weren't sorry. They just found that they didn't work. Big shock. Big shock. Close to never been hacked. Yeah. And see, it's so, everything is just falling apart the way that it's supposed to, the way that they had talked about with the Great Awakening. They had talked about how this was all just going to fall apart. But by the time that you realize that it's happening, it'll all be over. So you don't need to worry about it. It's all just a show. 
And I can't come down on the people who keep telling me, you know what, this is just a movie. It's just a show. I can't come down on you because you're not wrong. It seems really scripted. And I'm not going to come down on you for it because it seems obviously very scripted, very coincidental, very. Joe Biden was supposed to save us, right? If if the bad guys were in charge, Joe Biden would be the best fucking president in the planet. Like, and nobody would have, this diary would have never, ever, ever been found. And, and the laptop would have never, ever have gotten out. That wouldn't have happened if it were still Obama, still like the bad guys in charge for just a lack of a better, I don't have any better words, the villains. <laughs> There's no way that would have happened. I, I'm, I don't know. We'll see what happens. It's all scripted, but more so than it's ever been more so here in 2024, 2023, 2024 than it's ever been. The media has always been biased. You can go back and you can kind of look and compare, but it has never been like this because it's just falling apart. The Israel, I mean, did you guys watch Tucker's interview about Israel? Sonia, did you watch that? Holy balls. Go watch it. They talk about how Israelis are, are doing like mass executions of Christians on Beth. I like, I didn't, I don't know enough about the whole thing. I know that. A lot of people told me the Israelis and the people of Israel were God's people and I needed to just kiss their feet when this all started. And I am not of that belief. I am the belief that we're all God's people. But he came out with some guy and the guy was just like, look, they've been killing them. Christian, they hate Christians. They've always hated Christians. And here we are like slobbing their knobs, trying to send them money. Like, take care of your own country. I'm sorry that it happened. I'm sorry, but what's going on in Palestine? But we are not the world's police. Like, y'all better figure it out. It sucks. It sucks big donkey dick. But our border's open. I just watched another video, right? Some train station, like a million more people just standing around waiting for their gift cards. Like, I'm, we got problems. We got big problems here. Problems that I, I would rather worry about. It's very interesting what's happening. I dove into dead internet theory yesterday. Sonny, have you ever heard of that? So the dead internet theory is that, that the internet changed probably about 2017, 2018, drastically changed and was taken over primarily by artificial intelligence and bots. And the guy proved it by going to Facebook. And if you ever go to Facebook and you see those things, like you've spent a lot of time on the internet like we do, you see those pictures that are obviously AI generated, like Jesus in a turtle shell. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, have you seen those pictures? They're just, you know, obviously there's something very wrong with them. They're usually posted in groups. And millions and millions and millions of comments are like, amen, and this is how it should be. Like the same comments over and over and over again. Like it's AI posting the photos and then it's AI boosting its own photo. And so AI is feeding off its own algorithm. And it's been doing, he says it's been doing it for like two years. And so now they've kind of gotten into this groove. So you don't actually see, it's very, very rare to see real engagement on social media from real people. And he says it's been, it's been building and blooming since like 20, 20, I think he said 2017, 2016, 2017. Like that's when it really started to take off. All fake skin disease. Yeah. Do you remember like the bubbly things that you.